second. Psalms 81, I'm just going to read one verse tonight, focus on one verse. I'm interested in verse number seven. The Bible says, Thou call, caused in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah. Selah. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We are so grateful to be able to come to church tonight. Lord, it's good to always assemble with your people. Lord, I'm glad that you've provided this oasis in the desert of this world, a place that we can come and center our thoughts and our hearts upon the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I'm glad we can come out from among the world and come amongst our kind. Lord, I thank you for the good fellowship. I thank you for the good singing, and I thank you for the good testimonies. Lord, you're a good God. Lord, I realize that some had faced adversity this week, and maybe even today. And so, God, I'm thankful that in the midst of their adversity, they still uh, found something in the gable in their soul that propelled them to want to come to the house of God tonight. So, God, I pray you'd bless them for it. I pray you'd help us tonight. You'd enlighten our minds. Lord, you'd edify the body of Christ. And, God, you'd encourage your dear saints. Now, Father, I do pray, as Brother Phil's prayed, if there's any amongst us tonight unsaved, lost without God, might be a church member, I don't know. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight unsaved, I pray tonight be the night of their salvation. But Lord, I'm interested in the saints of God. I pray you do something special for them. Lord, we certainly did enjoy the good season of revival last week, the good services on Sunday. But Lord, none of that will suffice for tonight. And so, Father, I pray once again you'd meet with us afresh and anew from the Word of God. God, you would... Uh, Certainly give us what we need to help us tonight and for the days to come. Bless the meeting down in St. Lucia next week. God, I pray you'd help Ambassador Baptist Church. Those are some darling folks. God, I pray that you'd bless their sacrifice to want to be a blessing to all those men that will come from other islands. Now, Father, I pray that, God, you'd bless there. Now, Father, help us. Be with those that are sick, those that can't be here tonight. Be with those that are watching via live stream. And God, just get glory to your glorious name. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This is one of just a few of the psalms right here in the middle of the psalms where the psalmists are reflecting upon the hand of God and how God delivered miraculously Israel out of Egypt. And in this particular verse, uh, the psalmist is referring that uh, uh, he delivered them from that very place, uh, uh, the place where they had been enslaved for some 400 years, uh, where they were the ones that helped build those great cities of Egypt and helped make the bricks and they were the victims of evil and harsh taskmasters. Uh, and uh, in their trouble, they called upon the Lord, uh, and the Lord delivered them. Uh, he also refers to, uh, 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 in this verse, where he answered them out of the secret place of thunder. What a, what a thought, uh, the secret place of thunder. Uh, I don't know about you, when I think about thunder, I don't think about anything secret. Uh, a lot of times, uh, thunder's worse uh, than the rain, the wind, and even the lightning. Uh, uh, the sound of the thunder will get your attention. Uh, but God says the secret place of thunder. Uh, and he's referring to uh, when he brought the children of Israel through Moses to Mount Horeb, uh, and God's presence was on the mountain, uh, and the mountain thundered, and the people were afraid to approach it. Uh, and Moses went up on the mountain, uh, and the secrets of God were revealed to Moses uh, on the mountain of thunder. Uh, uh, and then he also uh, 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 brings out that uh, uh, he proved them uh, 
at the waters of Meribah. The waters of Meribah is where Moses led them to a dry place uh, where there was no water. Uh, and they're in a desert place. Uh, and they had no water for their livestock, no water for their children. Uh, uh, the children of Israel began to murmur and complain, uh, thought they were going to die of thirst uh, there in the desert. Uh, can I say, just like God, uh, he told Moses to take the staff that he provided him with uh, and smote the rock, uh, and now the rock gushed waters uh, uh, to be able to take care of that crowd. Uh, can I say... Uh, they estimate there was about 6 million Jews at the time, plus all their livestock. Uh, I don't know how much water came out of that rock, but there was enough to sustain them all. Uh, and God proved them there, uh, and he put them to shame. Uh, how many times have we murmured and complained in our life only for God to show up anyway and to meet our needs? Uh, so that's what this uh, uh, verse in this psalm is really dealing with, how good God was to Israel and all that he had done for them. Uh, but I want to look at it in a practical application for our lives tonight. Uh, I want you to notice some things about this verse. First of all, notice the desperation. The psalmist said, Thou, thou calledest in trouble. They were desperate. They could not help themselves. If God did not intervene, they were going to perish. Can I say that it's one thing for us to stand up and say, suck it up, buttercup, and to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and to get over it. Uh, but can I say there are some times... Uh, when we're facing things much bigger than us, uh, there are some times uh, uh, when we don't even know how to put one foot in front of the other, uh, and all the terminology of this world uh, about helping ourselves uh, doesn't do us any good. Uh, and But I'm glad to report uh, that in our desperation, there is one who can help us. Uh, there is one who is listening. Uh, there is one that the situation is not too big for. Uh, and that's the Lord. We see he was desperate. You know what's wrong with a lot of God's people? We don't get desperate. We try to handle everything ourselves. Mm. You know, I remember a time when, when folks couldn't run to the grocery store and put down a little piece of plastic and get groceries. I remember a time if you didn't have cash, you didn't carry. Mm. Uh, and people had to depend on God when they didn't have anything. Hmm? I remember those days. Folks got desperate. And it's an amazing thing. When folks get desperate, they can grab a hold of the horns of the altar and they'll find help. I can remember a time when folks uh, didn't have a local doctor they could run to. And the babies got sick. They had to get a hold of God. I can remember a time, uh, 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 friends, when uh, 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 the nation uh, would even come to the church house uh, and the leaders of our countries would ask God's people to pray. But see, we've learned to live without the help of God. And that's why our homes and our nation's in the shape that it's in. That's why our churches are anemic. Why we haven't seen true revival in this country for over a hundred years. It's not a bad thing to get desperate. Hmm? We see the desperation. Notice the deliverance. Verse 7 again. Thou caused in trouble, and I delivered thee. Isn't that just like God? Hmm? Did he not say, Call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not? Hmm? You know why we don't see great mighty things? We're not calling. Can I say God's line is never busy. Mm. You can never bug God too much. Mm. Can I say we can all call on God at the same time He hears us all. And when we truly call God from the depths of our soul, God hears and God delivers. Mm. We see the desperation. We see the deliverance. Notice the dialogue. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. Can I say God answers us? The world only hears noise. But we can hear the voice of God through the pages of his word. Hmm? It's amazing how God acts. 
You remember in Acts chapter number 9 when the Apostle Paul was Saul of Tarsus and he's on, his, on the road to Damascus on his way to go to rest and, and do away with some Christians uh, and, and the Lord showed up and the Lord spoke to him the Lord knocked him off his horse uh, uh, the Lord uh, 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 blinded him and the Lord changed his life that day remember Paul said Lord what will thou have me to do you don't ever hear many talk about the two fellows that was with Paul they heard a noise but they didn't hear the voice. Can I say, uh, 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 we come to the house of God, uh, and through the singing, through the preaching, through the testimony, we can hear the voice of God. Uh, a lot of folks only hear noise. Uh, but aren't you glad for the dialogue of God? Uh, hey, he said, my sheep know my voice. Uh, aren't you glad that even uh, in the midst of chaos of this world, uh, maybe on the job, maybe out behind a lawnmower, uh, uh, maybe you uh, just doing your everyday normal thing, aren't you glad God can show up and speak to you? I'm glad for the dialogue of the saints, aren't you? We can hear from God. Hmm? But then notice, if you will, the definitive. He said, I prove thee at the waters of Meribah, Selah. And that word Selah just means take some time and ponder on this stuff. But I'm interested in that thought. I prove thee at the waters of Meribah. And can I say this, that many of you don't know this about me. You know some things about me. You know, you know, back 100 years ago, I was a real hothead, and I really didn't feel worthy to surrender to preach because I knew what that Bible said about the man of God being temperate and how God touched me. You know, when I was dealing with all that, that, you know, I... I knew the man of God had to be the husband of one wife. I didn't even have one cooking. I just met Miss Annette, and I thought she ain't going to want. She ain't going to want to stick around for this deal, huh? But you know a lot of things. You know that I played ball, and you know all those. But one thing you may not know about me. And that's pretty because some of you have been sitting here 25 years hearing me preach. Ray had hair when he, when I became his pastor. It was curly and red. Hmm. Uh. Yeah. Red. He is the red-headed stepchild right there. Uh, but what you may not know about me is I factored out 42 years ago. Gosh. 42 years ago, I used to race competition canoes. Matter of fact, a uh, buddy of mine and I, as we started out, we were the Greenhorn team, the beginning team of the Ohio State champion canoe racers. There was also another fellow in our circles who went on to row in the Olympics and got a medal in the Olympics. My hometown still has his name up, or it did the last time I went there, and it's been a long time because my hometown is worth leaving. Are you listening? But, uh, uh, you know, used to race canoes. Now, the canoes we raced aren't like the kind you can go over here and rent, you know, that weighs 7,000 pounds. The canoes we raced were made out of fiberglass. They only set out of the water about four inches. And it was a two-man canoe. Uh, the guy in the back steered. The guy in the front uh, helped direct which way to go. And, and you had to be in sync. And there's a real art to it. Uh, and used to race canoes. Uh, and uh, when we would be in a race, the average race was uh, nine miles on a river. And uh, the way the race would always start, Brother Ed, we'd always start, we'd go upstream for a quarter of a mile and then turn around and head downstream. That way is a fair start. We'd all line up. They'd sound the horn. We'd row upstream. And then we'd, uh, there would be a marker or a bridge or something. We'd go around and head downstream. And we had nine miles to the finish line. And we were racing canoes. Is, uh, there's an art to it. There's a lot of uh, different things about it. Uh, 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 but if you're not in sync, you're not going to do very well. And also, every river's different. Every body of water's different. And uh, uh, racing canoes is a, is a real thrill, especially when you hit some rapids, because, man, you can really shoot out of them things, and you can get down the river. But also, you don't hit it right. I've seen many, many fellas split canoes in half. So there's a big thing about it. So I got to thinking about all this. Monday, as I was reading this, he said, at the 
waters, he said, I prove thee at the waters of Meribah. This is what I want to preach on, thinking about the racing canoes, this nine-mile trek down a river. I want to preach on this thought. When you hit dead water, every river that we ever raced, somewhere in that nine-mile span, the river widens out and the water gets very still. It's dead water. Can I say, uh, it's a thrill when you're shooting the rapids, but it is not a thrill when you hit dead water. Some of you this week have hit some dead water. Last week, we was in a thrill. We was here in revival. Brother Sidney was here uh, stomping and a snorting, uh, and he was uh, throwing the Word of God out. Uh, and I don't know about you, but every message I got some help from, uh, I, I, I'd heard a, a, a message or two uh, uh, before, and I've heard a lot of those illustrations before. Brother Sidney and I are several meetings together every year, uh, 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 but I, every one of them was fresh. Every one of them was wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, listen, had a good day on Sunday. Uh, I, I, whether you got anything out of it Sunday morning, I enjoyed preaching the Word of God. Uh, uh, Sunday night, I enjoyed Brother Caleb preaching. Uh, hey, what a blessing that was. I enjoyed all the singing over the weekend. Just had a good time. Uh, uh, but then Monday hits, then Tuesday hits, now Wednesday's hit. Uh, 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 you're shooting rapids when you're going through a revival meeting. But if you're not careful, around the next bend, the next day, the next week, you hit dead water. And so I want to preach on when you hit dead water. Can I say, first of all, when you hit dead water... You've got to row with all you've got. If you hit dead water and you kick back, you're not finishing first. You hit dead water and you just barely putting the paddle in the water, you're not going to make it in a very good time. You know when you're on the river and they turn the lights out, it's not the street lights. It's the sunlight. And you don't want to be on the water in the dark because motorboats are out there. Hmm? And some of you, if you're not careful, you hit dead water, you're pulling your paddles out of the water. You know what you do when you hit dead water? You dig deeper than you've ever dug before. You reach down as far as you can. You sling back as much water on that paddle as you can get, and you just keep a digging, and you keep a digging. You put your head down, and you give it all you got. Romans chapter number 1, verse 15, the apostle Paul said this, So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. Uh, what Paul said, uh, I, I'm coming to Rome, uh, and as much as in me is. In other words, uh, he said, I'm going to give you all I got. Uh, everything I've got, I'm going to throw it out for you. Uh, I'm going to let it go, uh, hold nothing back. Uh, and when you hit dead water, uh, uh, it's not time to coast. Uh, it's time to give it all you got. Uh, hey, if you got to crawl to the house of God, you crawl. Uh, hey, uh, if you got to crawl to your prayer closet, that you crawl. Uh, hey, if you got to get up an hour early to open the Word of God to find some help, you get up early. Uh, uh, you give it all you got. Uh, hey, you crank up your radio uh, and listen to a good old CD or some good preaching. Uh, you give it all you got because you've hit dead water. Uh, if you don't give it all you got, you're going to die in that dead water. Mm. Say, so, preacher, I'm desperate tonight. You're in a good place. You've hit some dead water. Now what you need to do is give it all you got. Hmm? Paul gave it all with gumption, unction, and presumption. He gave it all he had when he went to Rome. Can I say, when you hit dead water, you've got to give it all you got. You've got to row with all you got. Because, friend, it's been a while since I said this, but the Christian life is life or death. Coming to church is life or death. We'll either get closer to God and get greater spiritual life or we'll walk out a little more dead than we came in. Mm. Your life is life or death. 
How you conduct your vessel means life or death for lost people around you. Uh, 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 how you conduct your vessel means life or death uh, uh, for Christian folks around you who are looking to you and depending on you to be all you can be for Christ. Uh, when you hit dead water, you got to row with all you got. Can I say this? When you hit dead water, you've got to resist the fatigue. Everybody hits dead water gets tired. I don't care how good a shape you're in. I don't care how much you can bench press. I don't care all that uh, you put into it. When you hit dead water, that water feels like cement. And you will get tired before you get through the dead water. And can I say you've got to resist the fatigue. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 is the second place that Paul wrote this phrase. Uh, he said, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Can I say, if you didn't get tired and weary in the good fight of faith, you wouldn't be normal. Why do you think the Bible says that the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak? Listen, we all get weary. You get weary in the faith. If you're honest tonight, there's been times you've been sat down to read the Word of God to get some help from God, and before you got through three verses, your eyes were crossing and your head was nodding. Sure. You say, Preacher, has that happened to you? Yeah. Say, so what do you do? I get up and walk for a minute. I've worn out the carpet from my office to the fellowship hall. Uh, you got to resist the fatigue. Hmm. We're all going to get weary. We're all going to have times at the house when something goes on, we got to make a stand. We're all going to face things. If you didn't, number one, you're not saved, or number two, you're not normal. Somebody that tells you the devil never bothers them, they're telling on themselves. Hmm. If he's camped outside your house, it means you're probably living pretty close to Jesus. Hmm. But I want to tell you, with the most sincere and most uh, 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 honest intentions to try and live for God, you're still going to get weary at times. You've got to resist the fatigue. Hmm? Huh? Now, I wasn't a wrestler. Chloe Best not here. She don't wrestle enough to understand this. But I've been told this, that the body, if you can endure six minutes of pain, you can get through anything. Six minutes. There's something that kicks in, some kind of adrenaline, that once you get to that point, it kicks in and you can handle whatever you're faced with. Well, my dear friends, in the Christian faith, we got the Holy Ghost. And if you'll resist the devil, he will flee from you and you will find a win from another world that will propel you. Uh, you've got to resist the fatigue. Hmm. You say, preacher, I don't know that I can do it. You can't. But the one inside you, he can. But he won't just show up and do it until he sees you're serious enough to resist the fatigue. Huh? And I say, when you hit dead water, you've got to row with all you got. You got to resist the fatigue, and then you got to rely on your training. We used to train all the time. It's funny if you'd been in my hometown. This is how I know it was 42 years ago. I had a 1974 Caprice Classic. It was as long as this row of pews. Huh? Had a 400 in it. I only had it for about a year. My mama got tired of putting gas in the thing. I went from that to a Volkswagen. What a blessing. But that Caprice Classic, I'd put that canoe on top of the roof. Had, had four forms that where the canoe would fit right in, and I'd tie it off on the front bumper and the back bumper and go all through town with that canoe on top of my car, huh? Hey, not all of us had pickup trucks back in the day. But can I say, I could put that canoe up there by myself. 
but we trained. My buddy, his name was Dale. Dale and I would train on his farm. His dad had a big old farm, and they had a big old pond, and we trained in the pond. No rapids, no running water. No, Why? Because it's dead water. We trained, and we trained, and we trained. So when we got to the race, we knew what to expect. Matter of fact, before every race, the day before, we'd go run the river. And keep in mind, our sponsors were state champions. They'd take us down the river, and they'd tell us, don't get too close over here. Stay away from that area over there. Do this. And we trained, and we trained. We knew the river. We knew everything about it. Can I say, when you get out there in the race, you can't run blindly. You can't just beat at the water. You've got to rely on what you've been taught. You've got to rely on those things, those, those times that you put in. Listen, folks are all the time saying, well, I'm, I'm so afraid to tell somebody about the Lord. I don't know what to say. Friend, if you, if you just start talking, the Holy Ghost will give you what to say. You put more of the Bible in you than you know. And the Holy Ghost, part of what He does is He brings out stuff you don't even know is in you. huh? You've got to rely on your training. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul said this, And the thing that, things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You've been, you've been sitting in the house of God. You've been studying the word of God. You've been uh, 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 listening to the preaching. You've been trying to apply the preaching. You've got to rely on that. Don't rely on some newfangled something comes out of uh, Joe Olstein's mouth. Don't uh, uh, rely on something that's not proven. And they say, I prove thee at the water. You've got to rely on the training that you have. Hmm? Listen. You got to depend on the scriptures. You've got to uh, realize that you don't seek things that are unproven. Can I say this? I get stuff in the mail all the time. How to build your church? How to build your church? Do this, you'll build your church. Do this, uh, open up an online giving. Your your money will go up. Do this. There's only one problem. That's not what the Bible says. The church is to be supported by the tithes and the offerings of the people. Uh, and uh, I've heard people say, well, you build a church this way, you build a church this way. Well, Paul said through, through the, God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Uh, can I say, if it's not built upon the Word of God, it's sinking sand and it won't last anyway. Mm. You've got to be careful. Don't seek things that are unproven. And listen, drifting from the sanctuary never ends well. It amazes me. People get problems in their life. The first thing they do is start, start quitting coming to church. But they don't quit their job. I'd quit my job before I'd quit God. Mm. Uh, just rely on your training. When you hit dead water, listen to me. This is very important. You, you have to rid yourself of excess water. Remember, I told you, our canoes only set out of the water four inches. Now, when you've got a, 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 an oar or a paddle and you're flipping water both ways, guess what? Some of it gets in the boat. When you hit dead water, that's the time to get rid of the water. We used to train, train relentlessly how to jump out of the boat, flip the canoe, get the water out, flip it back up without putting more water in it, and getting back in the boat without taking water on now keep in mind, a lot of these rivers, you hit dead water, your feet's not on the ground. So we would have to simultaneously grab the canoe and both jump up at the same time and straddle it and get in, then put our legs in and get back to rowing. And we got to where we had certain timing that we had to uh, uh, make certain we did it so quickly. But you had to get rid of the dead water. And you got water in your boat in the dead water, you're in trouble. You're having to do twice as much work just to get the same distance as people who don't have any water. You don't get rid of the excess water in the boat when you're in the rapids. You get rid of it in dead water. Hmm? Listen, Hebrews chapter 12 says this, verse number 1, Wherefore, seeing also 
But we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. When you're in dead water, you've got to get rid of the weight. And can I say, when you're in dead water spiritually, the burdens seem heavier. I mean, when you're in one of them services and everybody's a shouting and folks are throwing babies and folks are running aisles and everything, man, you're ready to tackle the world. You're ready to charge hell with a, with a water pistol. But when you're in dead water, the most minuscule things, little molehills become mountains. And you've got to get rid of the weight or it will take you under. How do you get rid of the weight? You roll it over on the Lord. He can handle it, friend. You can't. Got to get rid of the weight. Got to get rid of the worry. I've never seen a time where so many of God's people have so little faith and they're full of worry. I just got a book and I started reading it today. It's entitled, Winning Over Worry. I thought, I need to read this because about everybody I talk to is worried about something. So I started reading it today. It had a wonderful illustration. I thought that'll work in the message tonight. Pay attention. You might need this. Huh? This fellow wrote the book, said years ago when NASCAR was really at its pinnacle peak as popular, you know, everybody, you know, had a NASCAR driver. Then they all retired. Nobody cares about NASCAR anymore. I mean, it, it ain't fun. I mean, it was fun back when, you know, you had uh, 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 Tony Stewart and you had... Uh, 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 Dale Jared, and you had, uh, oh, what's the guy you hate? 24. Jeff Gordon, pretty boy. You know, Bobby Labonte, never could finish a race, but he hit every wall he came in contact with. What a blessing, huh? You know? Everybody had their drivers. You know, Rusty Wallace and all them guys. Well, now they got a bunch of sissies, you know, nobody cares anymore. But this guy that wrote the book said that uh, he, he knew somebody that ran one of the tracks or something. They invited him down, and, he, and they let him give a devotion to the drivers before they went out to race and everything, and uh, gave a devotion. And, and uh, 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 the guy who drove the, the pace car, now the pace car is the car that goes out and first to start the race, kind of when I told you we had to go up, up river and then start the race. The pace car goes first and gets all them cars running, and he pulls off the track, and then they go for it. huh? Well, the guy that drove the pace car, he'd been in NASCAR 30 years. Well, he was going to take them, before, before the race started, before anybody really got there, he was going to take them around the track in the pace car. So him and his wife and, and the guy that, that ran the, the thing, all four of them with the driver got in this pace car. And he said, him and his wife's in the back seat. Well, this guy's got it cranked up. He's doing about 140 miles an hour around the track. He said, he said we're going so fast. And he said, all I can see is about, about a hand's width between this car and the wall. And he said, and he's just flying around this thing. And I'm looking at this wall. And he said, me and my wife are scared to death. We're holding on to each other for dear life. And the guy driving turned around looking at us, talking and everything, just whipping around that track. Uh, and he's like, hey, buddy, just keep. And he said, and it dawned on me. He said, what am I worried about? He said, we worry because we want control. He said, I realize I had no control in this car going around this thing. He said, and I realize that this fellow's been driving these tracks for 30 years, uh, and he drives every day 140 miles an hour. Uh, I don't drive that speed, but he does. Uh, so I just decided I wasn't going to worry about it. Uh, I was going to let him have it. Uh, we enjoyed the trip from that point on. Uh, and can I say, you and I need to realize uh, we cannot control anything. Uh, uh, the Lord's in control of everything. Uh, uh, why are you uh, losing sleep? Uh, why are you worried about it? Uh, why don't you take your hands off the wheel? Uh, let the Lord have it uh, and just enjoy the trip. Hallelujah. You need to get rid of that dead water. Worry will kill you. Uh, and worry is a sin. The Bible says anything that's not of faith is sin. Mm. 
You need to get rid of the weight. You need to get rid of the worry. You need to get rid of our willfulness. Sometimes we're too stubborn. It's okay to have a little pride to stand up for the Lord. But sometimes we're like Peter. We're big mouthed and stubborn. And we get in the way of the Lord. Friend, when you get dead water, you got to rid yourself of the excess water. Can I say this? This is a great truth if you're ever going to race canoes. When you hit dead water, learn to ride somebody else's wake. We won races because we position ourselves that when we got to the dead water, we'd be right on the tail of another canoe. He's doing all the pulling. He's doing all the work. We didn't have to work as hard. Uh, his boat was taking the dead water away from our boat. Uh, and we just was able to uh, uh, keep a nice steady pace so that when we got through the dead water, uh, we had more in the tank than they did. And we could pass them. Uh, and we won races that way. You and I need to learn when we're in dead water to attach ourselves to somebody that's on fire for God. Somebody that's taken the brunt of the devil. Uh, somebody that's uh, uh, just got a little extra st uh, zeal in their step. Uh, and just attach yourself to them. Uh, uh, just uh, do what they do. Uh, uh, just ask them to pray for you. Uh, ask them to help bear your burden. Uh, hey, attach yourself to somebody else until you're able to row your boat yourself. Uh, uh, said for years, if you're sitting in a service and you're sitting over here and you got your legs crossed and your arms crossed and nothing seems to be happening right here but over there uh, Phil's are shouting and having time get up uh, go over there and sit by Phil uh, maybe some will rub off on you uh, and maybe hey maybe God will sit down in your lap too huh attach yourself to somebody that's doing something for God don't go hang out with somebody as bad as you you don't have a pity party you go find somebody that's got a little touch. Uh, somebody that's on fire. Uh, uh, somebody says, hey, you want to go knock on some doors and invite folks to church? Uh, so I don't feel like it. Do it anyway. Uh, it'll help you. Uh, maybe somebody say you want to do a Bible study. Uh, maybe somebody say you want to go to church and pray. Uh, hey, you find somebody that's doing something for God and hang out with them for a little while. Uh, it'll help you in your dead water. Hmm? Can I say this? When you're in dead water, you got to remain focused. It's so important. Because when you're in dead water, if you're not careful, you get to look at all around. I'll never forget a few years ago, some of us went up over there in Indiana and we took some canoes out. And it's easy look at the scenery. I don't think it was in canoes. We was in, we was in some something. And there was a snake come off the pit, off the side of the thing. I couldn't enjoy the river because I'm looking at the snake. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's a God-forsaken thing when a snake gets in your river. But I'm here to tell you, he's a looking to get in your river. Uh, you got to remain focused. He said, why, preacher? you got to remain focused because... When you get to the end of the dead water, the water begins to flow again. And you're so excited that the waters are flowing again that if you don't remain focused, you'll forget that there's underlying currents. And in a moment, in an instant, when you're not expecting it, you're going to dig down too deep to propel yourself a little farther and that underlying current's going to throw your boat into a rock, and you're done. you got to remain focused. Listen, I'll never forget, we was in a race, and we was killing it. I mean, we was killing it. We had a half-mile lead. I mean, we was killing it. I mean, we could have put the oars in the boat and kicked back and let the boat conduct itself down there and won the thing. He's killing it. You see, when you travel a nine-mile mm, course on a river, there's all kinds of bridges that goes over rivers. And our, our 
team, what they would do is they'd be up there on them bridges every time they get to us, and they'd tell us what place we're in, tell us what speed we're going at. They'd be hollering out directions to us, tell us what to go. And so as listen, we hit that last bridge, and we had such a big lead, they looked and said, man, they got this thing in the bag. That river was flowing. It started flowing. We come out of dead water. It's flowing. But there's something about me. Winning ain't enough, Brother Bob. I want to humiliate those that I'm playing against. You know, if you really put your foot on somebody's neck, they'll never rise up to challenge you again. Hmm? All that fatigue that you face, you get re-energized in the rapids. Rapids are just ahead. So I don't know where you are tonight, but I kind of think some of you may have hit some dead water. Job said, man's days are few and full of trouble. You're going to face some dead water. You're going to face some time where it's not flowing. You're going to face some times where it gets a little rough. Just keep at it. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay focused. And friend, for long, you'll find a wind in your sail again. You'll find. Keep focused. By the way, there's nothing like crossing that finish line. You know, nine hours. If you rent them big metal canoes and take a nine-hour trip, that's about a four, four-and-a-half-hour trip. When you're racing, we'd run nine hours in about 32, 33 minutes. The Lord's got delights. That's all, Sam. Maybe God spoke to your heart tonight and you want to come talk to him. The altars are open. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Say, preacher, I need some help. That's a good thing to admit. You can find help in Jesus. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's a present help in time of trouble. But you can find help in your church family, too. Come tonight, God will help you. They're picking out a song. Some are coming. Let's pray. Father, we sure do thank you. Lord, you help us in every season of life and everything we face. You're the anchor within the veil. God, you never allow us to travel any water that you haven't already went through and proved them. But Lord, you prove us in the waters. Lord, when we get to that dead water, we'll find on the other side of it we were stronger than we ever thought we were and you were closer than we ever dreamed you'd be so Father I pray somebody's going through some dead water and you're proving them tonight help them to see your hand God give them strength Lord help folks tonight Lord certainly for somebody here tonight not saved it wasn't a salvation message but if you've been dealing with them about their sins I pray they'd come trust the Savior Lord I just pray your will be done in this invitation. Speak to hearts. We we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.